I know, it's fine. Hi there. Um, I, I know it's a little early tonight. We're, we're starting early this time because last time we had a session, um, we ran over time and, and had to run out of the library and didn't have enough time to answer all the questions. So we wanted to make sure that we got everybody um, everybody's questions answered. We do have a lot more people signed up, so I apologize if there are people coming and going, but we wanted to get started so you guys could, could um, get the full um, presentation. I want to introduce, um, my name's Kate Mayer. I'm one of um, the uh, BUILD parent representatives for Tredyffern East Town School District. BUILD is an organization called uh, that, that serves um, parents of students who have learning differences. So kids with IEPs, kids with GIEPs, gifted IEPs, kids with 504s. Um, and then an initiative of BUILD is Everyone Reads TE. And it started out of um, a personal experience that I and, and the other two um, founders had uh, with our children um, who have dyslexia or other language-based learning disabilities and, and our um, kind of journey in learning about um, evidence-based reading instruction and what was missing from um, what our children got um, early on and, and how um, different their experience would have been had they gotten it. So we've, um, this initiative is almost three years old. Um, it actually st started three years ago, but we didn't get going in, until about two and a half years ago like it, um, in earnest. And we, we've had um, a lot of great progress in the district. Um, and and it, it's slow, but sure. Um, there are some changes that have been made, and we'll talk about them that we're really excited about. Um, and then the other thing that we're really, really excited about is that we've just um, really um, got a network of parents who are um, informed and learning more about their children's um, reading acquisition. And what that's doing is making sure that those kids um, are getting intervention early or just getting um, the right type of um, support um, early on. And, and so we have a lot of families who we've supported in the district um, and, and around the surrounding districts. Um, and one of the people who's been instrumental in that is Dr. Galvalli. Um, and I, she's one of my dearest friends, and I can't say her last name. I'm really, really sorry. <laughs> Not really my last name. <laughs> but Jackie is um, a professor um, at St. Joe's. She's a founding teacher um, at AIM, Acad AIM Academy, so one of the people who started AIM Academy. Um, and um, she is just a wealth of knowledge. Um, she's also one of my partners in um, uh, founding of the Reading League Pennsylvania, which is an organization that um, supports teachers uh, across the state in accessing the science of reading for free. So we launched in January, well, we did our first event in January, and um, I think we had over 300 attendees um, via online in watch parties and in person. Um, and so um, it's just amazing. Um, I, I taught a long time ago, and I don't have anywhere near the wealth of knowledge that Jackie does, um, and I think you're really, really lucky to hear from her. And what I would say is that there's a lot, this is dense stuff, but if, if you're parents, if you're teachers, it doesn't matter because when you walk away, you're gonna walk away with something that you can do with your kids in the classroom. Um, uh, and, and, and you'll be, I, I'm sure you'll be very happy with it. And then finally, before I hand it over to Jackie, at the end, if, if you are in Trudeau from Easttown, we're gonna have a short little presentation on um, some of the benchmarks that you might see coming home um, uh, for your elementary school kids. Um, if you're not in TE, I think it's still in interesting information because your district um, is using some sort of universal screening measurements and, and it would probably be valuable. It won't be very long. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks, Kate. Um, so, yeah, just to jump off um, and provide a little more context about me, um, I am the mom of three boys, um, which is what I'm most proud of, and my middle son is dyslexic. Um, and so, um, while this has always been my professional passion, um, seeing him kind of struggle with this and knowing what, um, how, how I can, you know, ease the path um, that I went through in advocating for him um, has sort of reignited my passion for this. And um, it was completely an enlightening experience to be on the other side of the table as a parent um, and a really humbling experience. So, um, so I want all of you to feel really empowered. Um, as Kate said, this content is dense, okay? And so uh, Louisa Most, who is one of the best researchers um, 
uh, in this field kind of said reading is, is rocket science and it, it's, it's complicated and you're not going to master it walking out of here. Um, but um, I think hopefully we're giving the foundations to ask some really good questions and some resources to continue to dig in um, so that you can continue to learn. Um, and hopefully you'll join us in the Reading League PA as we um, continue to, to expand, um, expand everybody's knowledge. So um, this is a four-part series. Um, so our first series was sort of laying the foundation about what are the cognitive processes involved in learning to read. So what is the brain doing? What parts of the brain are, are activated um, when it engages in a reading task? Um, and our second part um, was really highlighting phonology. Um, so um, Dr. Seidenberg, who is a cognitive neuroscience, um, says all reading starts with speech, and he's so right. So our brain was wired um, to speak and not to read. Um, so that really kind of set the foundation for what we're gonna dig into today, um, which is phonics. Um, however, if you weren't able to make our previous sessions, we will be um, giving a brief overview there. But um, our focus for today is phonics, cracking the visual code for reading and spelling. Um, so this is on your slides. I won't talk about me, but again, I'm at St. Joe's. I'm in special ed department. I'm really excited to be working with both um, uh, our uh, teachers that are going into um, uh, general education classrooms as well as special education classrooms, um, and they are so excited to have this content, so it's exciting for me. Um, so just to review our simple view of reading, um, to talk about uh, in thinking about you know the basic way that we can kind of uh, break re the reading process down, um, we have printed word recognition times language comprehension equals reading comprehension. Um, so just to kind of cue up some of that. Um, math, elementary math foundational knowledge that we have. Um, we, when we have that multiplication symbol there, what that's um, telling us is if we multiply anything by zero, what do we have? Zero. zero. Okay, so we have zero skills in printed word recognition, but we have amazing language comprehension. We still don't have reading comprehension. And the vice versa is true as well. So if we have amazing printed word recognition, but no language comprehension, we still wind up with no reading comprehension here. Um, and you can see how that, you know, if we only have a uh, 0.5 of printed word recognition, the implications as we kind of go down the line there. Um, so we want to kind of always be thinking about um, from instruction, from assessment, how are we assessing both sides of the equation so that we're getting that to that full 100% hole there. A lot of what we know about how reading, how to teach reading, um, how the human brain learns how to read comes from um, a lot of hard science. Um, so the uh, functional MRI um, is uh, one of the tools that sort of led to um, the framework that we'll be discussing. So if you've um, had the unfortunate experience of having an MRI, um, when you go into that donut looking to, um, there's a screen on top, and they can uh, present to you with reading tasks. And when the individual who's on the table engages with those reading tasks, they can see what parts of the brain are activating with, with different tasks. Um, and then with other, other tools like PET scans and um, eye tracking studies, they all sort of solidify um, what the brain is doing, whether it's a proficient reader like yourselves, or whether it's a struggling reader, or whether it's just a reader starting out, um, but what parts of the brain are sort of activating and what that looks like. Um, so when we look inside the brain, these are um, the four areas of the brain that sort of fire. So our orthographic processing system, this is really one of the oldest parts of our brain. Um, so that part of our brain is, was, uh, is responsible for pattern recognition. Um, so if you think about your you know, early humans uh, being able to um, track animal tracks, um, know faces, recognize recognize faces, know what food was safe to eat versus what was poisonous, that's what this part of the brain was evolved for. We have MacGyvered it in, in, the, these human, uh, in the evolution of humans um, to be able to recognize visual patterns like letters. Okay, um, So that's the first area that fires. Immediately following that, the phonological air, uh, processor fires, and that area of the brain is responsible for uh, speech sounds. Um, so you know, not, not just all sounds, but specific to speech sounds uh, related to language functions. And then these two parts of the brain independently process that information and then send it over here to the angular gyrus where it becomes synthesized. Okay? 
okay? So just thinking about that, we have now three, just at this stage in the game, we have three parts of the brain that are having to activate um, and, and synthesize information. So what does that tell us about the reading process? There's lots of ways to fail, right? Okay, there can be breakdowns in a lot of these different areas. Um, and so then ultimately, before that, and then, then we get over here into the language comprehension where we have meaning. Um, so understanding the bit different meanings of words as well as how they fit into the context um, as well. And all these um, processing systems support one another, um, but it really demonstrates for us that reading is a, is a, a complex skill. There's many areas for it to go wrong. Um, and when we're doing assessment or instruction, we have to dig into each of those areas to make sure we're understanding where a child is doing well and where, where they're struggling. So we can make sure the instruction matches what they need. Um, so this is how that this maps onto the framework for, for reading. So this is Seidenberg and McClellan's four-part processing model. Um, so we have at the lower level with a orthographic processor, that's symbol recognition. Um, and I connect that with the eye. A lot of these terms get really confusing for a lot of people, so I like to have as many color coding and um, you know, uh, graphic images as possible. Um, our phonological processor with the sound. Over here, that third area of the brain, the phonics bridge, okay? So where the sound and the symbol are meeting up, a meaning processor and then the context processor. And then over here, we have reading fluency, which is that sort of rainbow incorporating all the colors of the processing system, which tells us what? what do you think? That you can integrate all this stuff. Right, so in order to have reading, re, uh, fluent reading, all of these have to be firing seamlessly without, without an impact. If there's any hiccups anywhere along the line, it's going to be reflected in reading fluency. So that's why reading fluency is often such a huge marker in progress monitoring or assessment or benchmarking, all of those things, um, because it's kind of like a, a, a thermometer. Um, when you go into the hospital or you go into the ER, they're always taking your temperature, right, no matter what. That's just kind of like, how is your body running? Fluency is a good indication of how is your reading uh, function. So, um, so we, we talked about the simple view of reading. Um, we also have Hollis Scarbo, Scarbo's reading rope, which kind of breaks out, out a little bit uh, more. Um, this bottom strand, we have the word recognition strand, which includes phonological awareness, uh, which includes uh, recognition of uh, different types of sound units. So we could have word level, syllable level, um, all the way to the individual phoneme. Um, and if you were with us last time, um, I hope you got the message how important it is to make sure kid, kids are proficient and automatic, uh, really putting an, an underline under that automatic word, at being able to uh, manipulate sounds at the individual sounds level. A lot of times instruction uh, will stop before they become proficient and automatic um, at manipulating at that individual sounds level. Then we have decoding, which is where really what we're going to be focusing on tonight, as well as getting into some sight word recognition. Um, I like this rope, rope uh, metaphor because um, in, in addition with these higher level skills of language comprehension, including background knowledge, vocabulary, um, uh, inferencing, um, uh, all language structures, thank you. Um, if any one of those uh, strands is frayed, then our rope is going to be weakened, okay? Um, so all of these have to come together tightly, um, and vocabulary is, the, is one of the ones in that upper strand that really has the most impact there. So just some vocabulary to quickly review. Um, these PH words are so, so tricky and get so confusing. But phonological awareness is a global awareness of the sound structures of speech and the ability to manipulate those sounds. So um, uh, Caroline is a little too young. This the beautiful baby in the back of the room is a little too young. Um, but soon um, her mom, Katie, can sort of start developing phonological awareness by you know, having her identify how many words are in a sentence. So do you want some milk is five words. Okay. So when we initially talk to our children, um, that just sounds like one long speech stream. So if you think about when you travel to a different country and, are, and some people are you know, speaking in their language that they're fluent in and you either are completely unfamiliar or not as fluent as them, it's more helpful for them to slow their speech down and maybe exaggerate the pauses in between the words. 
um, so that we can identify what the units are there. Um, and so you can put yourself in the place of young children um, when we're giving them speech streams and they're not able to identify what maybe what was the individual word uh, or the syllable and then expecting them to jump all the way to what was the individual sound. Phonemic awareness is really um, where we want to put the most amount of emphasis in terms of our instruction. Um, because phonemic awareness, as we'll look at in a minute, develops from big units, so that word level awareness, down to that individual uh, sound awareness. This is what has the biggest connection to proficient reading. This is where we have to have our students proficient and automatic. Um, Dr. David Kilpatrick will say phonemic awareness instruction should continue all the way through the end of second grade for all readers. Yes? Um, is fluency just the ability to pair it, or does that have to do with comprehension speech? Fluency is an indication, is, a, is really highly correlated with comprehension, so it's sort of like a necessary but not sufficient aspect for comprehension. So you could have fluent readers that cannot comprehend. So it has like a 0.91 correlation, so we can predict that a fluent reader will also comprehend. We can't guarantee it. Okay. Yes? I actually was a teacher for more than 30 years, and I had a little boy who struggled um, to uh, with, with, with the fluency piece, but he got through most of it. <laughs> you know, I've taken him through the steps of uh, most of the course by that point. He had all the six syllable types, and he could decode everything at that point, but um, it was not um, effortless for him. But his company, he was also happy to be gifted, and, and he his comprehension was completely intact so long as he had extended time. So he was one of those little exceptions. So I don't know, they're not the same thing, but... They are not the same thing. Right. Absolutely but not. Ab on, on average. Um, yes, yeah, more often than not, correct. I would say you need to be a fluent reader. I would also say, um, in my experience, you know, as, as I was a Wilson um, teacher as well, I still use Wilson. The biggest thing to me that I think in the past, I don't know, maybe seven, eight years has really led us to really realize the uh, importance of the automaticity at the phonemic awareness level. So Dr. David Kilpatrick has really expanded this um, and just done a phenomenal job at kind of really making sure, um, making us understand how this lays the foundation for building um, what we'll talk about in orthographic mapping. So being able to rapidly identify what graphemes attach on to those, those sound units. So um, for my students that were still struggling with the fluency, if, you know, coulda, woulda, shoulda, I wish I could go back in time and really emphasize that automaticity um, at the phonemic awareness manipulation level, mm -hmm. not just blending and segmenting, which is mostly what Wilson will do. So, um, so phonics, um, another PH word, um, but it, this refers to the, uh, the knowledge of letter sounds and the ability to apply that knowledge in decoding unfamiliar printed words, okay? Um, so this is, you know, that synthesis of that visual processing processor and the sound processor. Um, and being able to understand what the relationship is with the sound um, and then the visual, um, visual symbol that goes, goes with that. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about um, English. Um, so most teachers, most parents, most individuals um, who talk about the English language will say, it's crazy. We just have to, you know, we just have to accept it. Um, and English, I'm not going to say it's a simple language. Um, so when we talk about the orthography, which is um, the, the rule system for the spelling patterns um, in the English language, English as a language is what we call a deep orthography. So there's a lot of different ways that we can represent individual sounds versus a language like Finnish. There's one sound, there's one way to spell it. <laughs> and it makes life a little bit easier. Um, but uh, English, um, we have a lot more different, you know, interesting ways to say things. However, um, this study has, um, it's an old, old study, um, but it has been replicated um, and it, 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 it's persisting. 50% um, of all words are predictable by rule. So if you know the rule, you can definitely break that word down. Additional 36 of those words are predictable by rule with one error, usually by a vowel. Another 10% of words will be predictable if you can incorporate morphology and uh, the language of origin. That leaves 4% are true oddities. Okay, so when we give students the message that um, we have to make guesses, um, we can. I, I always want to uh, push my students to attend to the parts of the word that they can break down. 
um, and then use use uh, principles to make make the best educated guesses they can if they get down to this point of the four percent. Can you give an example of the thirty-six percent and four percent? Like, what do you mean by one error? Um, so, it, like a uh, one deviation. So the vowel sound might be like every every other part of the word is um, uh, decodable by a rule, except for uh, like one one of the vowels that's in, embedded in the word. Can you give one example of one? Can I do it after? <laughs> okay. Um, one of my weakest things is um, coming up with specific words that uh, provide an example for something on the fly. So I apologize uh -huh. for that. Um, but um, in terms for the morphology or the language of origin, so that's a little bit easier for me. So if you think about like some of the French origin words, like Q-U-E, understanding like what that pattern might represent. Um, so some, incorporating some of those uh, uh, those uh, spelling patterns that uh, are holding on to wherever the, those words came from in the, in, uh, the development of English. Um, so I, I always want to try to uh, explain to my students we have rules in English, um, and that it's not crazy, and that you don't you you we, that we need to guess to um, get through things. Um, so let me just take a sip of water. Okay, so backing up for just a second, um, what is orthography? Um, orthography is the writing system of a language including letters, numbers, punctuation marks, and diacritical mark remarks. Um, this is best um, achieved through distributed practices. Um, so many, many, many sessions work better than sort of doing a deep dive and saying we're going to spend 45 minutes on TH says, okay, so not only do we lose that with attention, um, but short, quick sessions in repeated fashion yield better results in developing this. Um, phonics is the relationship between the written language and the sounds of spoken language, um, which is our, our phonology. So, when we're thinking about this side of the river, we have our phonology with our ear, that phonological awareness. Um, as I mentioned, um, Caroline is you know just starting maybe to understand um, awareness of individual words. That's where all young children will start, all humans will start uh, being able to develop, develop their awareness of the individual words, then at a smaller unit, jump into the syllables, develop rhyming, first sound, fluency, onset, so on and so forth, until we get all the way up here, which starts phonemic awareness at the individual sound level, and then being able to substitute sounds, okay? Um, so um, say the word cat. cat. Now, say, uh, now say cap instead of ah, say ah. Uh -huh. Good, okay? So you all are wonderful and proficient and automatic in your substitution, that manipulation at that individual phoneme level. Um, that's where we need our kids to be. So that was sort of an easy one um, because it's just a, a, a three sound word, but improving their ability um, to think that way. Um, then we go over the phonics bridge, and then we have orthography on, on, on this side. So while phonology develops from big to small, orthography develops from small to big, okay? Um, so once we have kind of developed this ability um, to kind of continue going up, developing increased, uh, com increasingly complex phonological <coughs> skills, we start mapping them onto the letters, starting with individual graphemes, so individual letters. So a grapheme is basically a picture of a sound, a visual picture of a sound. So the, whatever the letters are that represent that. <coughs> Digraphs, um, taking our knowledge of that di is two letters that make one sound. Okay, so an example of that, it would be the CH um, makes the ch sound, okay? Trigraphs, three letters that make one sound. So if you think about the TCH in match, that makes the ch sound, okay? <coughs> then we have vowel teams, which can have two, three, or four letters, um, excuse me, to represent that. Blends are those consonant sounds that, that, that um, uh, smash right into each other. Um, so if you think about the word stop, um, a lot of times my early readers or my, my struggling readers, um, they'll spell that as sock. They'll, that T sound will drop out, um, and uh, the, the, those blends are particularly tricky for them. Um, and then under having an understanding of the syllable patterns in the English language, 
understanding about morphemes and then the implication when you add morphemes onto a word, what spelling. And then entomology is what um, we talked briefly about with, when Cheatham asked that question. Understanding where does the word come from and what, what spelling rules um, would apply because of where that word uh, comes from. So if it's a French origin word, we can make, we have expectations for that. Um, if it's an Anglo-Saxon word, we know what to expect. Um, so our readers that get all the way down there um, have the benefit of that um, and it, it helps in a lot of different ways. So in that phonics bridge back here, this is where the magic happens with that alphabetic principle. Okay, so the alphabetic principle um, are that letter and letter combinations are symbols that represent the speech sounds in words. Um, so that the sounds of language are represented by letters and letter combinations. Um, so B makes the B sound in boy, and OY makes the OY sound in boy. Okay, so we're always going back to speech. So when we're talking about reading, we're always talking about the speech sounds. Okay, so how many sounds are in boy? B, boy. We have two sounds. The kids will say, well, that doesn't make sense. We have three letters, right? Okay, and all of you who are proficient readers, another one of my favorite quotes, quotes by Dr. Um, Mark Seidenberg talks about when you have developed the alphabetic principle, it becomes like a virus in your brain, and you're always thinking about spelling through the lens of letters. Um, so it gets hard, especially for my new, newer teachers who are just um, starting to learn this, in thinking about, well, if we have four sounds, they're thinking about the letters. Okay, so um, for example, um, say the word box. Box. Tap out the sounds in box. Uh, uh, let's see. Wilson teaches you to do three times. So there's a reason for that as we get further yeah. into the orthography. <laughs> but box has four phonemes. But ah, right. the X is a letter that represents the k and s sound together. Okay, four sounds, three letters. Okay, match. M a ch. Three sounds. We have three graphemes because we have that T C H. Um, but we have more than three letters, okay? Everybody? Yeah. Um, okay, so um, i just like to um, bring this poem up. So who, who would like to volunteer to read? <laughs> okay. I take it you already know of tough and bow and cough and doe. Some may stumble, but not you, on hiccup, thorough, slop, and brew. Beware of herd, a dreadful word that looks like beard and sounds like bird. Okay, good. Okay, so just you, you, like some of these words, you have, to sort of, there you, go. <laughs> you have to sort of think about um, because we have that really rich, that deep orthography. We have a lot of different ways to represent these sounds, um, and um, we as proficient readers can um, we we pick that up. Um, and we've mapped that on to the sounds, um, but our younger readers have not. So, um, Our phonics instruction when we're teaching this, it has to be systematic and explicit. Um, so include systematic and explicit instruction of the sounds and the spelling patterns that represent them. We also need an explicit instruction on recognizing high frequency words. So we're going to talk about that frequently um, in a minute. We hear these words a lot. So who here has heard of systematic and explicit? Okay, who here has heard of scope and sequence? Okay, who here feels like they can explain it really well? <laughs> okay, it's like a little tricky, okay? Um, so explicit instruction refers to a lesson in which the concepts are clearly explained and the skills are clearly modeled without vagueness or ambiguity. Okay, so it's not a discovery learning. We're not asking the kids to figure out which vowel team says oi and which vowel team says oo. Okay, we're going to explicitly teach O-Y, says O-Y boy, oi, and we're going to drill that in. So if I say, um, you know, uh, C-H, um, C-H, chin, ch, now you repeat, okay, having that explicit instruction and talking about where we're going to see the C-H, when we have C-H at the beginning of a word, it's going to be spelled with, uh, or I'm sorry, when we have ch at the beginning of a word, we're going to spell it with C-H, when we have C-H, uh, the ch, at the end of a word, of a one-syllable word, it's going to be spelled with the T C H. So it depends on the vowel. Sound. Yes. Each. Yep. Each. Right. If it's a short, short if it's a short vowel. Sound. Yep. Um, so when we think about scope and sequence, um, we want it to follow as a predictable 
order. Um, so English has 52 letters, both upper and lowercase, 16 upper, different from lowercase, 44 sounds, 150 spelling, punctuation and directionality. It's a lot of stuff um, to pack in. This is why it takes years to become proficient in phonics, okay? Um, we want to organize it so it goes from simplest to complex, most stable to least stable, okay? Um, so just because a program has a scope and sequence doesn't mean it's systematic. The instruction has to be cumulative. This is what the biggest disconnect is with most of the curriculums out there. And they will say, we have a system. We have a scope and sequence. So this week the spelling pattern is O-Y. Next week the spelling pattern is E-E. -E. It's not building on each other on, on week to week and it's not reviewing and ma making sure that they're maintaining the proficiency from the week before. I don't want kids to memorize their spelling words. I want them to know the rules and the patterns of where they're going to use these graphing patterns. So it doesn't mean much to me that you know my um, my, my son, my dyslexic son, will say, "I know all my spelling words," um, but when we put it into a novel word, that he's not replicating that. Um, so it's the skill, um, and that's what that systematic aspect of it. Um, so I can see some of you are sort of looking at me like, okay, like what's what's the what's the golden egg? What's the, what's systematic? Um, and we'll talk about why that's confusion, uh, confusing. But just like look at this, all these ways to make that that e sound. How tricky this is. Okay, and a lot of these sounds are introduced in first grade, so it becomes really difficult for our kiddos. Okay, especially when some of them can say something else. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Um, yes. Um, so this is um, kind of replicating that bridge uh, image that we had previously. Um, so phonology developing from big to small. The, the uh, systematic scope and sequence is going to start off with those individual phonemes. It's going to build to digraphs. <coughs> it's going to build to trigraphs. It's going to go to your most stable vowel teams, the most frequent and most stable. So what do I mean by the most stable? That we can expect that they're, they're going to say that sound. Um, and then moving forward down, down the line. Um, there is no one research approved scope and sequence. Okay? But generally, this is where we start with that single consonants, the consonant digraphs. Um, so that will kind of address the uh, one of our syllable patterns in English. Um, our magic E, which is sort of the, one of the easier syllable patterns to represent. Um, we have long vowel sounds at the end of words or the syllable. Y, R controlled, silent consonants, vowel digraphs, um, and then uh, the variant vowels. So the different spelling and then the, those diphthongs, which can be really tricky for kiddos. Um, so what does good phonics instruction include? Um, in, instruction develops an understanding of the alphabet principle. Um, it will incorporate phonemic awareness. Um, so again, going back to our previous module, 10 minutes a day for all, all kids, kindergarten, first and second grade, should be spent on direct and explicit phonemic awareness skills. Okay, using that as a warm up to jump into, okay, now we worked on the sound, now we're gonna look at the letter patterns that are gonna map on 